Untuk melihat sejauh mana perkembangan kegiatan riset berdasarkan data penelitian yang dimiliki dalam skala nasional. Terlebih lagi, repository institusi sebagai wadah penyimpanan aset pengetahuan saat ini baru dimanfaatkan untuk, untuk melihat sejauh mana perkembangan kegiatan ilmiah. riset berdasarkan data penelitian maju yang, yang dimiliki dalam skala nasional. Risetnya, negara lebih lagi tanggung jawab dalam melakukan pengelolaan data penelitian melalui repository nasional seperti Australia dengan ENS, Inggris dengan UK Data Service, serta Belanda dengan DANS. Pengelolaan data penelitian dengan menyimpan pada media tertentu seperti komputer, laptop, atau eksternal hard disk kurang dapat diandalkan dan beresiko untuk rusak. Selain itu, ada resiko lain yang tak kalah berbahaya, yakni hilangnya media karena pencurian. Di mana hal ini sangatlah disayangkan, mengingat data tersebut adalah hasil kerja keras selama bertahun-tahun. Oleh karena itu, penyimpanan pada repositori institusi menjadi solusi yang paling ideal. Perilaku peneliti dalam melakukan penyimpanan data penelitian sangat bervariasi. Dalam kajian yang dilakukan oleh tim PDII LIPI, bahwa selama ini peneliti melakukan penyimpanan paling banyak pada media laptop atau personal komputer dan berbagai penyimpanan eksternal. Kondisi ini diperparah dengan backup data yang dilakukan semaunya. Dalam melakukan penelitian, seorang peneliti idealnya sudah memiliki satu perencanaan manajemen data. Banyak sekali manfaat yang akan diperoleh peneliti, institusi, maupun negara ketika bisa menerapkan manajemen data penelitian dengan ideal, yakni efisiensi. Ketersediaan data pada repositori nasional akan mengurangi kegiatan penelitian yang serupa. Safety Berbagai resiko kehilangan data yang disebabkan oleh perangkat penyimpanan dapat diminimalisir dan juga merupakan upaya untuk melindungi hak kekayaan intelektual. Quality Repositori akan membantu peneliti untuk menjaga kualitas data dan proses kurasi memungkinkan data penelitian terpelihara sehingga dapat digunakan kembali. Reputation Seorang peneliti akan meningkat reputasinya saat datanya digunakan kembali oleh peneliti lainnya. Compliance Kewajiban menyimpan data yang ditetapkan penyandang dana penelitian dapat diakomodir melalui repositori institusi. Pentingnya mendepositkan dan membagikan data jika dilakukan oleh peneliti terbagi menjadi tiga keuntungan. Bagi peneliti, dapat meningkatkan reputasi dan visibilitas penelitian individu. Bagi komunitas ilmiah, dapat meningkatkan kolaborasi. Dan bagi masyarakat, mereka akan mendapatkan akses yang lebih mudah ke dunia penelitian. LIPI, melalui Pusat Data dan Dokumentasi Ilmiah atau PDDI, menginisiasi kegiatan pengelolaan data penelitian melalui sistem penyimpanan data penelitian dengan nama Repositori Ilmiah Nasional atau disingkat RIN. Dengan kapasitas yang tak terbatas, RIN mampu menyimpan dan berbagi data penelitian seluruh peneliti. RIN mampu berkontribusi dalam pemetaan perkembangan dunia penelitian. RIN, kunci kemajuan IPTEK Indonesia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's event. My name is Madia Reni Sulaiman and you can call me Reni. I'm research data librarian in PDD LIPI and will be your housekeeper today. First of all, before we begin the main session, we have have an opening session with Mr. Hendro Subagio. He is the acting head of PDD LIPI, the Center for Scientific Data and Documentation, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. I would like to welcome Mr. Hendro for his welcoming speech. The screen and the time is yours. Thank you, Reni. Honorable Ms. Sarah Stewart from the University of Oxford and also work at some university in the UK. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon from Jakarta, Indonesia, and good morning to our speaker who is in the UK. Welcome to all of, of, of you at the Research Data Management Webinar Series, Diversity in Science, which focus on open data in biodiversity, biodiversity research. 
Distinguished speaker, guests, ladies and gentlemen, as the central of uh, the National Repository and Depository, PDDI, Center for Scientific Data and Documentation, has an essential role in managing research data and publication in Indonesia. In 2019, PDDI has launched Repository Ilmiah Nasional, or we call RIN, R-I-N, and Indonesia Research Data Repository to support research data management activities. Especially in this case, who are done by researchers in biodiversity research and information professional to support them. We have curators to, uh, for specimens, and also now we are building the biodiversity center like a museum or gallery in Indonesia, specifically in Chibinong. We have many databases from zoological research, botany, biotechnology, microbiology, limnology, and those then will be integrated into one biodiversity data that have billions of digital and physical forms and managed by Lippi Brain. For that, we need uh, actually uh, more faster prepare for the, uh, the human resource needed for the demands in handling those diversity scientific data and scientific work for the future. Here today, uh, we have uh, Ms. Sarah Stewart who will give enlightenment on this issue. I hope uh, we could work together to design a great collaboration approach to uh, the Indonesian case. And all in all, good luck with the webinar. And I hope we could get many uh, inspirations from great dialogues today. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Reni? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Hendro, for the welcoming speech. Um, so in this series, we will be as our researchers in system, Systematic Botany Research Center for Biology, uh, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Her educational background was from Institute Technology Bandung for her bachelor's degree and then pursued her master's degree at the University of Reading, United Kingdom. She has been working in LIPI since 2005. Well, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Wita to start the session. Please, Ms. Wita, the screen and the time is yours. Thank you, Reni. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, fifth RVM webinar series with the theme Research Data Management, Diversity in Science, presented by the uh, Center for Scientific Data and Documentation in the National uh, Indonesian Institute of Sciences or PDDI DP. My name is Gita Wadani and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar, the Open Data in Biodiversity Research. This session is being recorded to be available for uh, viewing post conference. You can also watch this webinar live at Kepustakaan uh, PDDI DP YouTube channel. At any time uh, during today's event, feel free to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window. Uh, I will write them as a question at the end of the speaker presentation. Um, you can also upload questions that being submitted by others. Uh, this um, going to be key to getting the question that's the most popular among audience. Uh, should you have questions that will be more accurately said in Indonesian. Please throw that in the window, in the Q&A window. We will do our best uh, to translate that for Sarah. Hang on. I get my copy. Uh, before we proceed to the talk, we'll appreciate the uh, participants uh, to fill out the poll provided. Uh, please come to if you can. Uh, Yes, uh, I suppose going to popping up on the screen now is um, it's a poll from the company. Uh, yes, there are four questions. Um, 
please feel um, just click get the answer. <laughs> There's no right and wrong answer. Uh, these four questions will help us to understand demographic features of our audience. Um, yeah, we probably spare some one to two minutes for this. I really hope the participant could do that in. Uh, so the question was, if you pop up in your screen or to share, it's uh, the role of your institution, uh, do you produce research data, how do you um, do you manage your research data, and have you used the RIN data first, and have you used other repository than RIN? Okay, I think that's enough. Okay, so the, the the results come up now. So there's a 26% of librarians and 72% of researchers. Um, there's 2% of students and others 2% as well of our uh, audience. And 79% produce research data, 70% managing their research data, only 28% using AIS. Um, and only 23% that using other than RIN, mostly probably not. Thank you again, uh, uh, audience, for your participation. It's very helpful and well noted. So now moving on to the speaker session. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Sarah Anna Stewart. She's a DPhil candidate at Oxford um, Internet Institute. University of Oxford. Uh, she also working as researcher, uh, research information manager at the Middlesex uh, University UK. Her academic background is in biological science, science and technology studies, and information science. Her deep field of research is investigating the impact um, of open digital biodiversity data digital collection and uh, digital technology in research of the natural history collection. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. Um, you might want to tell us more about the research later on. She is a certified um, carpentry uh, instructor that provides training and skill for research software and data handling, including data cleaning, harmonization, and best practice of reproducible research. Her interest covered open science and how um, digital technology transferred knowledge and communication. She also is an advocate for open research and best practice for open data and software. So to join me now to hear her presentation on the open data in biodiversity research. Um, yeah, the thing is over to you. You have 14 to 16 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Vita. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rani, and thank you uh, also, Sir Hendro. Uh, Salami alaikum. Uh, good afternoon and good morning from London. Um, thank you very much for um, joining me this afternoon, and, and thank you also for organizing and inviting me uh, to this webinar uh, to participate in, in this research data management webinar series. Um, I'm very honored to be here uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I hope that you will um, learn, be able to get some useful information from this webinar. Um, I'm also looking forward to your, your questions and also to discussing um, your own work as well and how, how, you, how we can help um, manage your research data and also to make it fair. So that's findable, accessible, interoperable and uh, reusable. Um, oops. Okay, um, this, this webinar will be broadly divided into, into three different sections. Uh, the first section will be sort of a basic introduction to biodiversity data, what, what are biodiversity data. The second section will look at research data management in biodiversity, uh, particularly practical applications and best practice, focusing on uh, FAIR data. Um, and the final section will be a very brief um, case study looking at RDM in practice with a focus on the Natural History Museum in, in London, UK. This is the field site for my PhD research. 
uh, where I'm looking at the impact of open data on scientific research practices in biodiversity. I realize there's a lot to cover in a very short time, so this presentation might be very general uh, in scope. But if you have any questions, I'm looking forward to discussing them with you uh, during the webinar. And certainly after the webinar, you're more than welcome to, to contact me because I think with research data, it's very important to take a collaborative approach. Before I get started uh, into the webinar, um, I, I just wanted to give a brief background of how I, how I uh, ended up working in research data management. Um, I actually started off as a biologist working in systematic botany. Uh, studying um, the phylogeny of uh, freshwater and marine algae. Um, there I was working with uh, specimens, um, with genetic sequence data, and eventually also large um, genomic data sets as well. And it was actually working with this data and learning how to manage it that brought me into librarianship. Uh, when I moved to the UK, I started working in libraries uh, and I, start, I developed a focus on, on research data management. Um, research data management has a great impact for, for your research. It can actually increase um, your citation, your impact, and the reach of your research um, because data can be used uh, in many different ways uh, if it's managed correctly um, and managed in, in a way that promotes fair uh, data sharing. So I think it's very important uh, to, to manage um, research data in such a way that it, it can be uh, reused and shared and cited, and then you will also gain increased impact for your research. I'm really excited to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, I wish I could be with you in person, but I'm glad that we have the medium of the internet uh, to exchange uh, information and knowledge uh, in this way. Uh, Indonesia is one of the 17 most mega diverse uh, regions in the world. Uh, it, has, it has a great importance for biodiversity research with its many different uh, biomes um, and certainly um, many different uh, species and taxa that have yet to be uh, described and named. So again, I think it's very exciting. I think this is, is a, a very exciting time for, for biodiversity research in Indonesia with uh, the development of your uh, research repository and, and your research facility. Um, but more broadly, why, why do you need to manage data in biodiversity? Well, in 2019, um, the Intergovernmental Governmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services published a report uh, stating that there is, there is an Anthropocene emergency. There is a decline, a rapid decline in biological di diversity and species richness due to climate change, habitat loss, overexploitation, and other anthropogenic causes. Um, because of this, um, biodiversity research and the data that underpins this research are crucial to provide current information and to support uh, further research, which can help ameliorate uh, the situation. Not only uh, is biodiversity data used internally within the biological sciences, but it's also used uh, in external disciplines to inform policy, um, to inform conservation and environmental protection, um, to underscore uh, land use and natural resources, and also in applied fields such as agriculture, food security, and pharmacology. So really this data underpins uh, research on a lot of the natural systems that, that sustain and support um, survival of life on earth. So now this brings me to the first section of my, my talk, which looks uh, in a very broad way at, at data in biodiversity. How is data in biodiversity defined? What, what is data in biodiversity? So to start off, um, since we're going to be discussing data, I thought it would be useful to generate uh, some data of our own. Um, I'm very curious to find out what you think uh, biodiversity data are. Um, so if you go to um, the website menti.com, um, this is a, you don't need to download anything. You should be able, to, if you have a, a phone or um, an app, you can, you can go directly to, the, to this website. Um, if you enter the code uh, 2184-5364, you'll be prompted to answer uh, the question, what are biodiversity data? And if you could just put in four examples of, it could be data that you produce, it could be data that you yourself manage. Um, I'd be very interested to see um, what kind of data you have. So I'll give you a few minutes um, to run while we run the survey and hopefully we'll see some results uh, coming up here. Ah, okay, excellent. 
literature DNA species. Great, wonderful. Any other any other input for data? Okay, ecosystem species, excellent, brilliant, brilliant. Okay. DNA, more DNA, great. National treasures, yes, indeed, indeed, very much so. Um, okay, yeah, more species data, so lots of taxonomic data, that's good. DNA sequences, brilliant. Epitypes, yes, yes, great, that's a really good one. And literature, and NGS data, yep, okay. Collaboration, yep, brilliant, brilliant, and publications, certainly. That's, that's, that's wonderful to see. We'll give it just a few more minutes if, if anyone wants to add in more data. So references, uh, agroecosystem, yep, definitely. Lots of species, diversity, locality data, yep. Fantastic, you know, it's great, great to see all of these responses. Okay, brilliant, brilliant taxonomic names, biogeography, herbarium specimen data, yes, and floras. Species richness, biomes, ecosystems, great. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. No, it's really good, good to see all of this, all of this data. So I'll give it a, another minute or so, um, and then I'll move on to the next, the next slide. But yeah, so you can already see that there's a great diversity of, of different data types being produced here. Okay, um, so thank you, thank you very much for your responses. Um, indeed, uh, there are many different types of, of biodiversity data and certainly on, on quite a, a large scale as well. Um, one thing to note, the data are very heterogeneous and often composite, so you often have data that interrelate to each other. It can be digital or physical, so looking at specimens, looking at literature that could be digital in, in form. Um, Biodiversity data can have a historic component. So for instance, type specimens, which might've been collected uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, descriptions in literature or even artworks, so illustrations. Um, they're multidisciplinary, so taxonomic, um, sy systematics, ecology, paleontology, uh, molecular, geolocation. They could be in multiple formats. So images, photographs, sounds or sensor data morphological measurements, uh, surveys such as floras or faunas, and even citizen science. Uh, so this, this is often uh, um, expressed in occurrence data. Uh, the, the sociologist of science, Jeffrey Bowker, describes the diversity of biodiversity data as biodiversity data di diversity, which I think is a really uh, good way of, of describing uh, biodiversity data and in its, its variety of different forms. So alongside the heterogeny of biodiversity data, this also brings a lot of complexity uh, into, in terms of how to manage uh, such a diverse range of data. As I mentioned before, uh, biodiversity data can, have, uh, can be multi or interdisciplinary, so it can cover many different disciplines within the biological sciences. It can be at multiple scales or have different layers. So for instance, geolocation data, um, it may have historical components so antiquarian manuscripts, which might not be readily available for use, uh, field notes um, or artworks. It can be born digital. So uh, for instance, genomic sequence data or genetic sequence data, so DNA sequence data. Um, it could be sensor data that's picked up uh, from environmental sensors, uh, GIS geolocation data. So there's many different data types that are only available in a digital format. This can also include uh, digital specimens as well. So if you have a physical specimen that's digitized, you have then two separate potential pieces of data that interrelate. Um, and you also, within museum collections, often have type and voucher specimens for comparison as well. But unfortunately, um, because of these heterogeneous and often disparate data types, you can end up having data that is lost, damaged, or missing. I mean, this is unfortunately part of the nature of natural history collections is that they're organic and they can be damaged or, de or decay. Um, data can be inaccessible. So in the case of, of rare type specimens or antiquarian um, manuscripts that describe the specimens, 
they can be held in different institutions. So it's very hard to bring those data sets together um, for further research, or they could be incomplete because um, part of, the, of, those, of that data composite has been lost. Um, but thankfully, uh, biodiversity science itself is, is itself an information science um, right from its historic foundation. So this, the image that, that is in this slide here um, shows paper slips um, that relate to this herbarium specimen. This was actually um, a system devised by Carl Linnaeus, one of the founders, the founder of um, the taxonomic bi binomial naming system. And he used uh, the system of paper slips to keep track of various names and descriptions of species and types that he himself identified. So immediately there's a, there's a way of, of structuring and ordering information about nature to make it uh, more accessible and more findable. Um, again, just to emphasize the informational nature of, of biodiversity studies, um, this is the 1745 edition of Linnaeus's Systema Natura, um, and on the right is a diagram of his sexual classification of, of, of plants using the reproductive systems. So again, um, very much focused on um, the informational aspects of, of biodiversity data and how, to org how best to organize this data so that it, it can be used uh, for, for further purposes. This is also reflected in systematics as well. Um, on the left is the tree of life, which Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin actually created. Again, this is another way of organizing um, data, biodiversity data. On the right is the most recent molecular uh, tree of life for all um, life. So it includes metazoa, archaea, and bacteria, and fu fungi, along with um, along with the other groups. So you can see already that there's, there, there are ways of order organizing and structuring um, data uh, within the science itself. This is further emphasized by museum collections. So museum collections, which form um, the foundation for a lot of the, the research uh, within biodiversity studies, they themselves, those collections themselves are databases. Unfortunately, a lot of the information within uh, museum collections tends to be locked up, um, be partly because of the disparate nature of the data. Um, you may have a specimen, but then it's hard to know what it relates to in the literature, whether it relates to any genetic sequence data. And this, this was quite a, a big problem in biodiversity studies until the advent of, of the internet. Um, many taxonomists would spend um, their life work working on a single group and trying to, to aggregate and collect all of the data together in one place. So with the advent of the internet, it became uh, much easier to start aggregating um, a lot of the biodiversity data, particularly data that had been made in a digital format. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, uh, which is an international nonprofit organization focused on making biodiversity data searchable and accessible uh, via the internet. So GBIF is, is interesting because it aggregates um, biodiversity data from many different institutions around the world, including the Natural History Museum, as I'll, I'll uh, point out. It also provides free and open access to biodiversity data and um, also offers um, some useful uh, advice for best practice in um, biodiversity data management. Most of the data held on GBIF is actually distribution data for taxa, um, but it also holds quite a lot of systematic uh, and taxonomic data in addition to other uh, data types. And one of the, again, now that it's becoming much more, uh, well, easy in some ways to, to uh, aggregate data, disparate data and bring it all together, um, recently, there has been work on the extended specimen or, or the so-called digital specimen concept, which uh, link, starts to link um, and integrate uh, data from a specimen to other data types that relate to it. So for instance, in, in this diagram, you, you may have a, a specimen which is represented by this mouse. Um, the, the data that is, are linked to it will include uh, specimen data, so, so physical specimens, um, any morphology, any images, um, tissue samples, but also molecular, molecular data, um, symbionts and parasite data, field observations, so the locality, um, the date of collection, 
any um, ecological or related behavioral data. And that actually starts to bring together um, a more holistic um, look at um, a, ta a taxonomic entity and the data that relates to it. So how this might look in practice, this is an example taken from Appalach Appalachian lichens. Uh, so you have um, a physical specimen and then all of the different related data types, including digital, the digital specimen image, any digital specimen records that relate to that physical specimen, uh, ecological and morphological data, environmental samples, tissue samples, field images, molecular data, um, the conservation status drawn from the I IUCN, uh, the distribution, any evolutionary inferences, so phyl phylogenies, uh, species descriptions, um, and other, other data as well, including biotic uh, interactions. So this concept uh, of an extended specimen, I think will be very useful uh, to keep in mind for biodiversity, particularly um, as more and more biodiversity databases start to become integrated um, and communicate this data more broadly. This, a lot of this integration of data has been brought about as well uh, because of advances in machine readable uh, metadata. So it, when you're managing your data, it's important not only to consider any potential human readers of your data, but also uh, machines. Um, computational methods such as text and data mining can be used to integrate and find new patterns in data. So the two studies that I have um, shown here uh, were conducted at the Natural History Museum by researchers there. Um, within uh, the group of Dr. Natalie Cooper. Um, the first study published in 2019 looked at um, patterns in collections management, which I thought was quite interesting because it's sort of looking at how the collections are being managed. Um, it, Natalie Cooper and her colleague, colleagues conducted a survey of several large um, natural history collections, looking at type specimens of birds and mammals, and actually found that there was a, a bias towards male uh, specimens in the type. And this may be because uh, certainly with male birds, um, they're much more visually appealing. Um, so that, that kind of uncovers an interesting pattern in the collection management there. The other study conducted uh, the primary authors, Emily Buckingham is a master's student. Um, she looked at um, natural history collections, several different natural history collections to investigate changes in the range of the pangolin over time and sort of looking at how um, the, the range of that species has decreased as a result of uh, trafficking. Mm -hmm. So again, very interesting use of computational methods to uncover patterns uh, within, within data. So it's, I think it's very important then to take into account um, machine readable metadata uh, for biodiversity data. Now, I haven't yet explicitly mentioned open biodiversity data. Well, why would you want to make uh, your data open? Certainly, um, in, in previous um, scientific cultures, it was actually considered not a good idea to release your data openly. Um, you should use it yourself to generate your own uh, publications and gain academic credit. So why should you make this data open? Well, certainly for biodiversity data, there's a very strong case to make um, data open whenever possible. Um, the data that uh, is generated in biodiversity can contribute to global knowledge about biodiversity. Um, data publishing will enable data sets held all over the world to be integrated. So again, uh, revealing new op opportunities, new patterns, and even new collaborations between uh, data owners and researchers. Publishing the data openly also allows individuals and institutions to be credited for their work um, to create and curate biodiversity data. So it gives visibility to the institutions that are creating and publishing this data through, um, through their metadata. It's also useful not only for scientific researchers, but also for collection managers. Um, publishing data openly will enable um, the ability to track the usage and any citations of digitized data. Um, so for instance, data access through the GBIF and similar infrastructures. And finally, it enables transparency and validation of scientific research, particularly if it's used externally to the discipline or in a context uh, where the data was originally produced. So for instance, in applied fields like agriculture and pharmacology, or even in policy, it's important to know where the data has, has come from, whether it's accurate, um, and whether it reflects the needs of those external uh, users of the data. 
finally, data data should be biodiversity data should be made openly because uh, it effectively democratizes the data. Uh, many research funders now see data generated in scientific research as a public good, which should be made openly available for use. Um, the other the other issue in biodiversity is that uh, much of the world's biodiversity is located in the global south. However, most of the funding and research infrastructures are located in the global north. So it's important to address these inequalities in access to data and research. And I think making data open helps um, address this to a great extent. Uh, GBIF have actually published a principle on open biodiversity data. So biodiversity information should be made freely available to be shared globally to enable their use for not-for-profit decision-making, education, research, and other public benefit purposes. Making the full detail of biodiversity information available should reduce the risk of damage to the environment and help safeguard a sustainable future. Where release will have the opposite effect, access to the full detail may need to be controlled. Now that's an interesting point. I mean, biodiversity data should ideally be made openly available, but there are cases, which I will discuss uh, later in the second section of my, of my talk, uh, where some biodiversity data may need to be uh, protected. And I'll discuss that sort of further on. Finally, I think it's important to acknowledge um, indigenous and local uh, knowledge of biodiversity as biodiversity data as well. Um, there's a wide recognition of the need for local community involvement, for instance, in conservation of cultural landscapes and natural history. This, this is coming from UNESCO and their LINCS project looking at indigenous um, knowledge of the natural world. Um, however, data collected in collaboration with indigenous and local communities um, should be managed according to um, specific guidelines that ensure that it's ethically uh, manage. So this is called, these are called the CARE principles, which are related to the FAIR data principles as well. Um, these were derived in 2019 at the Research Data Alliance um, meeting. Um, the principles of, of the CARE are collective benefit, authority of control, so enabling the, the community to, to retain control over their data and its usage, responsibility and ethics. So I think um, this is very a very interesting issue. I won't go into so much depth here. Um, but I think um, Indigenous um, and local communities can provide valuable insight into ecology and uh, biodiversity. Finally, um, biodiversity research is entering a paradigm of, of digital um, and data-centric biodiversity, so very much focused on um, data um, derived from museum collections. So this is a, a, a a statement uh, by Vincent, Dr. Vincent Smith, who is the founder and head of the informatics department at the Natural History Museum. This is from 2012, but you can see how, how well uh, this statement has, has unfolded. Uh, we expect that in the next decade, these data will become the new frontier for natural history collection management and research. So certainly data are becoming increasingly important for, for biodiversity research and effective data research data management, making the data fair, will help further that, that research aim and impact. This brings me to the second part of my, my webinar, looking at uh, research data management in biodiversity, so practical applications. Many of you in the audience who are librarians or research data managers may be familiar with uh, this, this diagram that I've included in, in the talk here. Uh, this is sort of a, a simplified diagram of the research life cycle, uh, the research data life cycle. So looking at the process of work from planning at the beginning of a project, uh, discovering data for use, all the way through um, to using data, and finally archiving and publishing and sharing data at the end of a project. So because of the diversity of different um, data types within biodiversity, I won't go into so much depth uh, in this life cycle, but it's something important to keep in mind uh, while you conduct your research um, to make sure to plan for, for data management, to think about how your data is stored, and also to think about how your data is, um, is, is shared, published, and archived for long-term use. So again, this is another quotation from, from Jeffrey Bowker. If we are, we are going to develop decent biodiversity policies, then we need databases held together through good metadata practice. And I think this is the key, key point uh, with any kind of research data. It all hinges on metadata. 
So um, there's, there's the, the poster below reads, metadata is a love note to the future. So really without good metadata, it's very hard to use and reuse uh, the data that you create. So it's very important to have metadata that will ensure that that, that data is, is fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so this brings me to FAIR. Um, FAIR data are the result of best practices in research data management. So you want to ensure that your data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, not only to support open research, but also just to support good practice and research overall and the sustainability of, of your, your data for the long term. So I'll go through each point of, of FAIR here. Um, these are very basic uh, principles, uh, but they can be applied in many different ways. And I'm looking forward to discussing with you uh, and finding out what you do with your own data um, within, within FAIR. So uh, data should be ideally discoverable online uh, in a searchable repository or, or catalog. So again, uh, using um, institutional repositories rather than personal um, hard disks for data that, that, is, that is published um, is, is ideal. Um, rich metadata should be used to ensure that the context and use of data is understood and also that the, the, the data can be findable as well. So it's particularly important for data that's being used outside of its original disciplinary context. So say, for instance, you have a floristic survey, which is then used by policymakers to determine um, conservation of land use. It's important to ensure that that data can be used um, in external cases. Um, which, which will certainly be the case with um, much biodiversity data. Finally, and I, I think very importantly, persistent identifiers such as DOI should be applied to the data and also should be specified in the metadata of the data to ensure that those persistent identifiers remain linked to that digital object. Uh, FAIR data should also be accessible. So best practices for research data management ensure that, that data is accessible. So it should be, as I mentioned before, data should be both human and machine readable. Often this, you know, for humans that may uh, require adding a readme annotation or a, a, a note to ensure that the data is understood and can be interpreted. Um, use licenses such as Creative Commons to ensure that access uh, for end use and reuse conditions are understood and that the data authors and owners can be credited appropriately. So it's very important also to cite any data that you use, and I'll, I'll discuss that further on. Um, however, FAIR does not always mean open. So certainly, although most biodiversity should be open, um, there are some cases where data can be sensitive, and I'll, I'll discuss that a bit later as well. Um, so access may need to be controlled uh, in that case. However, uh, metadata for the data can be made accessible, even if the data itself cannot be, cannot be made accessible. Uh, data should also be interoperable. Uh, this is slightly more can be slightly more challenging um, because how can how can you integrate sort of different databases that may have different uh, data mapping, for instance? Well, one of the one of the ways of doing this is followed by following recognized standards and formats. So, for instance, Darwin Core or XML for uh, machine readable data to ensure interoperability within data infrastructures. Uh, I would also recommend the use of controlled vocabularies, ontologies, and keywords within the metadata wherever possible. So this ensures that um, commonly used keywords can also help data become integrated because it can be linked um, through those keywords uh, and uh, ontologies in a way that makes sense and that will help better integrate uh, the data together. Finally, uh, references and links to related data uh, should be provided. So digital object identifiers are a really good uh, example here because they can be uh, interrelated with each other. Um, they, DOIs can be used for versioning, which I'll discuss as well. So you can have different versions um, of a particular data set. And this will also help link uh, data together as well. So I mentioned standards before. Uh, one of the, the most commonly used standards in biodiversity is, is Darwin Core. This is a, an extension of a, of a Dublin Core metadata standard, which is familiar um, for many librarians who are involved in cataloging um, different, different resources. So um, the, bio, the Darwin Core was, was developed by um, the Biodiversity Information Standards Group, which was formerly known as the 
Taxonomic Databases Working Group, which is part of the uh, Research Data Alliance. Um, Darwin Core is actually very widely utilized uh, by GBIF, uh, large databases such as Systema Natura, IDIG Bio in the United States, the Encyclopedia of Life, and other, other uh, large biodiversity databases such as FishBase and VertBase. So it's a great way of um, following the standards will actually enable the data to be linked and linked between different databases and, and aggregated. So it, it's very useful um, to follow uh, these standards. Uh, the standards themselves are actually based around taxa and occurrence uh, based on specimens, observation and related information. Um, so there's more information on Darwin Core actually um, in the link that I've provided below, which, which sort of provides um, a, a quick start uh, into uh, standards for this biodiversity data. So this is something to keep in mind when you're when you're cataloging your data sets in, in the repository. Finally, uh, fair data should be reusable. Um, it should there should be documentation to support understanding, interpretation, and reuse of data. So, for instance, if it's data that was produced uh, with the depend with a dependency upon certain software, so like phylogenetic trees, for instance, which may require um, Mr. Bayes or Paup or, or another software program to generate them. Um, and I think this is especially important if, if data are being shared outside of their disciplinary use context, just so that it's understood how the data were created, why they were created, and, and, and how. Um, so that can also help uh, determine how best to use that data in a different context. The data should be accurately and well described by metadata and have a clear usage license. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, they should have a clear lineage as well. So it should be known how the data was created, who created the data. So this could be the institution, for instance, where it, where it comes from. So um, a museum specimen and, and describing what institution that specimen is held at um, and why data produced are important for interpretation, uh, reuse, and also credit for the, for the data authors as well. Um, and I mentioned before, data that is reused should be cited appropriately because this ensures that the publisher or the creator of that data gets credit for that data and also gains impact for their own uh, research. Now, fair data can be can be um, a co can be implemented actually through uh, persistent identifiers or, or PIDs. Um, one of the most commonly used are DOIs, so digital object identifiers. Uh, many of you uh, working with academic publications may be very familiar with DOIs already. Uh, they're a mature uh, standard system for describing um, digital objects uh, online. Um, DOIs can actually be created for many different uh, data types, which is, which is great for biodiversity because it has such a diverse range of, of different data types. This includes digital objects such as digitized specimens, but also other digi digital data types and even physical specimens as well, um, as I'll, I'll show uh, with the Natural History Museum. Uh, DOIs can actually be used to cite specimens alongside uh, museum or herbarium accession numbers. Um, and it's a really useful way of linking um, physical specimens and any digitized images, so any digital specimens that are created from them as well. Um, and they're also useful for versioning and version control, as I'll describe shortly. So just to go in a bit more depth about uh, digital object identifiers, um, there are persistent identifiers used to uniquely identify objects. So it could be data sets, software, physical specimens, as I mentioned before, um, it's, a, it's an international standard um, identifier, so um, it's widely recognized and used around the world. Um, DUIs are presented as an alphanumeric code consisting of a prefix and a suffix separated by a slash. So the 10 at the start of the DUI um, positions that DUI within the DUI namespace. So it's effectively a, a permanent URL for for an object that will actually link that object to metadata that's held uh, in a digital way uh, about that, that object. And this is called the handle system. So uh, the DOI resolves by binding the metadata to uh, the specific uh, DOI that describes it. So a DOI is persistent uh, because of the, this technology, but it also requires, uh, like all technology, it requires input from the human side as well. 
Um, so it is the publisher's responsibility to update any metadata attached to the DOI, otherwise the DOI might resolve to a dead link. So if a URL moves, for instance, and a DOI is linked to that URL, it should be updated to reflect uh, that change to ensure that the metadata can still be linked to the digital object. So how are DOIs created? Uh, usually the data publisher will register and obtain a DOI from an organization such as DataCite or Crossref. Uh, DataCite is actually uh, recognized for um, data types, whereas Crossref is more uh, related to journal articles and publications. Um, in the UK, um, data site usually works uh, by having national hubs. So in the UK, that's the British Library who is responsible for providing um, DOIs, the, the facility for creating DOIs um, across the UK. Um, so DOIs are created and bound to metadata within, within the infrastructure and um, data sites APIs are used to create the DOI. So I mentioned DataCite, which is one of the, the major organizations for uh, creating DOIs. It's a nonprofit organization which provides the infrastructures for producing DOIs. Um, and again, just to emphasize that DOIs really help make data discoverable and citable, and also can help to link data sets uh, with other research outputs. So DOIs can also be used for versioning and version control of biodiversity data. So for an a really good example of how DOIs can be used to version data, versioning can be used for uh, long-term uh, ecological studies, for instance, such as plankton surveys, marine plankton surveys, where every year you have sort of a, a slice of data that's added on and you end up having an accumulation of, of data over time. What you can do there is have a, a DOI that will cite the, the whole study, so that, that will be a, a permanent DOI for the, at a higher level. And then the, the DOI for each, say, each annual year of data can then be added, and that will give a version. So you can have, a say, for instance, an annual version of that data. Similarly, if you search for data within that large larger data set, you can also use that to, to cite your data as well. And this is a really great way of actually ensuring that your research will be reproducible as well, which is often very important for open research. Um, it's important to be able to, to validate where your data is coming from and, and how you've um, reused it. So just, just to emphasize again, DOIs can be used to version data and ensure that versions are differentiated, but also can be related back to um, a larger project and cited uh, accurately. Finally, um, one of the most important points of, I mentioned earlier that FAIR does not always mean open. Uh, certainly biodiversity data can and should be made openly available wherever possible, but there are some rare exceptions. So in some cases, biodiversity data can be sensitive. Uh, for instance, if it relates to the geolocation of rare, endangered, and economically valuable species, uh, which unfortunately might face uh, exploitation if that um, that data was, was released into the public domain. So um, data, data that relates to these cases should only be released with caution. Uh, so for instance, this could include uh, the nesting location of rare birds or occurrence data for rare uh, and economically valuable plant species. Um, so basically when, when data about geolocation is used, um, think about any potential adverse effects if data are released into the public domain. That being said, this is a very, very rare um, exception. Um, in most cases, um, most biodiversity data can and should be uh, shared openly. This will ensure actually that um, the data can be used for environmental protection um, and conservation outside of the discipline where it was created. So my final point, uh, particularly when thinking about data management, is think about uh, data sharing and data openness. So we use fair data principles, open metadata, and persistent identifiers for data, and think about building bridges rather than data silos where the data is locked up and cannot be used um, in, in research very easily. So think about creating those links and those bridges between um, data, data and different data types. We've seen many examples of this uh, during my talk. So for instance, the, ex the extended specimen uh, concept, looking at how uh, DOIs can be used to link data and to version data, 
and even um, in integrations between different databases. So for instance, uh, the integration between uh, GBIF and its contributing institutions that, that contribute data into, into GBIF. So this brings me to my the third uh, and final part of my um, talk uh, today. This is looking a bit more detail at RDM in practice. So it's a, a, sh a very short case study of the Natural History Museum. Um, this is actually my field site for my PhD work. I'm, in, I'm still in very early stages of my PhD uh, research at the Oxford Internet Institute, but I'm uh, very interested in looking at the impacts of open data on scientific research practices in biodiversity. Um, the Natural History Museum uh, was founded in 1881, so it's one of the oldest uh, natural history collections uh, in Europe. It also is one of the largest uh, natural history collections in Europe. It contains over 80 million uh, collection items uh, in the life and earth sciences alone. Um, only 4% of these so far have been digitized, but um, the Natural History Museum is actually in the process of building uh, a specialized facility uh, near Oxford uh, which can be used to digitize more of the specimens and also uh, focus uh, and concentrate uh, research on, on data as well. So that will be a very interesting development and I'm sort of looking forward to seeing uh, what will happen uh, with that. Um, they're starting to move some of the collection items from uh, the Natural History Museum in South Kensington, which is this beautiful Victorian building, um, to uh, the, the new facility in, in Harwell in Oxford. And it will be interesting again to see what what uh, what results uh, from from that move. Um, the Natural History Museum is a very research intensive uh, institution. I mean, it's a beautiful place to visit as a if you if you want to come and visit the collections and the displays. Um, but it, it's really uh, quite a powerhouse for research. Uh, it has over three hundred scientific research staff. Over seven hundred peer reviewed publications are published per year. And it also um, has a very interesting uh, embedded biodiversity informatics department, uh, which uh, was, was founded by Dr. Vincent Smith uh, to focus on data within the collections and, and effectively unlocking that data and making it open and freely available for use. So it's this informatics department uh, partly that uh, a lot of my research will focus on. Um, the, one of the key developments of the, the Natural History Museum is their, their data portal. So I, it's, it's open and accessible for use. Uh, so if you want to have a look and explore yourself, uh, you can go to data.nhm.ac.uk um, and then you will be able to access um, some of the data from the collections. Um, this is a diagram of, of how the data portal uh, was created. I mean, the whole ethos of, of uh, the data portal is, is to encourage um, open research and data reuse from the Natural History Museum. So um, here we have um, scientific research staff will, will deposit data. It's based on a, a CCAN uh, repository. So that's a particular open source software type um, that, that's used uh, as a repository to data. Um, data can be downloaded. So um, the data types that are held on the repository are, are very varied, as, as I've mentioned at the start of my talk. So they include everything from uh, digitized specimens to research papers, um, to sound, sound data, um, geolocation data. There's, there's quite a, even uh, 3D scans. So you can actually uh, do a 3D print of, of a specimen. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting um, just to see how, how this um, data portal was configured and, and really promotes open research just by its very architecture alone. Um, this was the, the, the Natural History Museum data portal was launched in, 2000 and, in late 2014. Um, this is sort of what it looked like originally. So you can see here, it's a, just a, similar to GBIF, it's a searchable um, data portal, you can, you can search by keyword um, and access different data types, uh, including the maps. At the time, there weren't many data sets available, um, only 92 so far. But, um, but in 2021, um, the data portal came out of its beta testing stage. Um, it now contains 183. I think that may be actually increased. So there's, there's 
a, gr a great increase of the in data that's be becoming available uh, for use. Um, and also uh, it includes quite a lot of digitized uh, specimen material as well, including um, insect drawers and type specimens. So uh, this is very useful for researchers who may not be able to come to the museum directly to consult those um, specimens and, and types. So it, again, it will be interesting to see how um, this data will be used. The other part of my research will focus on how scientists are actually using uh, this data, both um, within the data, within the museum itself, but also looking at how they're using other sources of open data, such as GBIF. Um, so I'm looking at that, that part of the research still has to take place. It's been slightly delayed uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, many of the, the researchers have been working remotely. Um, so it will, again, it will be very interesting to see how, how that unfolds. And, and I'm really hoping to get a, an idea of how um, the open data will impact on, on um, research, or research in biodiversity. So this brings me to the conclusion of my webinar. Um, and sort of my main, uh, I guess, main take home messages uh, for the session. So biodiversity data should be made openly available whenever possible. So make sure to build data bridges, not data silos. Think about data sharing when you're, when you're working with your data. Biodiversity data will, will often be used outside of its original context. So it should be described uh, using appropriate and rich metadata to ensure that others uh, who are using your data, including machines, can understand how to use your data. Use persistent identifiers such as DOIs to ensure that data is findable, citable, and can be used to track metrics. Um, this will help uh, collection managers and, and researchers uh, gain credit for their work and also know how uh, their data is being used. Uh, ensure that biodiversity data are cited, again, to ensure credit and, and tracking for reach and impact. This is very important. Uh, I think it's it's important to um, have that reach and impact for the for the data for for the institution, but also for the researcher as well. Um, and finally, implement fair data practices to ensure that your data is managed so that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and finally, um, just uh, as a resource, it's important to get involved in the wider open data community around biodiversity research as well. So I've included a couple of links. Um, GBIF have an open data ambassador program, which is open uh, for any, anyone working in biodiversity research to join. Uh, so I've included a link to that program there. I think it will be very useful and it will help um, broaden uh, the network uh, for biodiversity data, work in biodiversity data, and certainly facilitate a lot of collaboration and exchange of ideas. Similarly, the Alliance for Biodiversity Knowledge, so looking at biodiversity informatics, um, and for, for the librarians and data managers in the audience, I would recommend joining the Research Data Alliance. Um, there are many uh, working in interest groups focused on biodiversity. I mean, I mentioned the, um, the former taxonomic databases working group, um, which I think is of interest to those who are looking to better manage uh, research data within biodiversity. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Um, many thanks to uh, Reni Suleiman and, and Rita Vardani, uh, and also the colleagues at the Indonesian Institute of Science for uh, inviting me and hosting this webinar. Um, I look forward to our further discussion and to, and to further collaborating. I'm very excited to hear about your own uh, developments and um, look forward to hearing from you. So if you have any questions after the webinar, you're more than welcome to contact me by email. Um, I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn, although um, probably best to contact me by email because I, I sometimes don't check uh, my messages uh, on social media <laughs> that often. Um, you can also cite this presentation. I'll, I'll ensure that it's sent around um, after, after the webinar is over as well, just so you'll have this information available uh, if, you, if you would like to refer to it. Um, and again, it's got, as I mentioned before, according to good practice, it has a DUI, so it can, you can use that DUI to cite um, and to link to the presentation as well. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining me this afternoon, and uh, I look forward to our further discussion. Over to you, Rita. Thank you, Sarah. That's a very enlightening uh, presentation. Um, then like, I think uh, a lot of 
audience have the same feeling as me because we have 10 questions and I don't think it's going to be a very short answer. Mm. So shall we um, start from the most popular questions? Um, mm. Also, it's quite, there are similar questions, um, Sarah, but the, probably I have to deliver that, that to you uh, separately. So how's the creation? The first one, how's the creation process in managing biodata? Bio to what extent? And are there any courses provided for information professional development skills about it? Hmm. Well, that's interesting. I mean, so the links that I, with regard to the courses um, mm -hmm. on research data management, there are several. So I've included some links. So GBIF actually have that, that uh, open data ambassador program is actually quite a good one, particularly if you're actively involved as a, a researcher in biodiversity yourself. Um, it's very much geared towards researchers uh, who are working in biodiversity directly. Um, there's a lot of good uh, resources there. Um, there are a few, a few sort of online courses that you can take, which I think will be very helpful. Um, looking at RDA is, is probably more geared towards data managers and it, it can be a bit complicated at times, but for basic research data management, I can actually send it, there's another link that I can send around. It's um, through the University of Edinburgh, there's something called Mantra. Um, I'll see if I can find it and put it in the chat uh, shortly, just so you'll have, you'll have that link. But if not, I can, I'll email it around with my presentation as well. Um, I didn't really go into the details of each stage of the research data lifecycle, which I probably should have, um, given, given that um, maybe not everyone is familiar with, with, with that stage. But certainly, um, research data management follows a very iterative lifecycle for the most part. I mean, when you start your project, it's often useful to, to look at uh, what data already exists. Uh, particularly in biodiversity data. I know there are many different databases to consult, but I would recommend perhaps starting with GBIF, since that often aggregates data from around the world and is, is sort of a definitive source for um, open biodiversity data. Um, look on GBIF, you can sort of find uh, different data sets. You can also look at the NHM data portal, for instance, um, although that also gets aggregated into, um, into GBIF, uh, but you can start from there. Um, when you, when you start uh, managing your data, I think it's very important to plan for research data management as well. So think about what kinds of data you're going to be generating. I mean, in your work, are you, say for instance, a systematic botanist working with herbarium specimens, and maybe you'll need digital images of those specimens and how will you, how will you create that? Are you taking morphometric measurements of the specimens? So will you be measuring physical parts of the specimens and recording them? in a database somewhere, and then how will you share that, that data? So the data management plan should really look at all of these steps, looking at how you're going to create the data, how you're going to use the data for your own research. You know, is, are you making a phylogeny, for instance, from those morphometric characters? Um, and finally, think about sharing the data as well and how you're going to do that. Um, so the data management plan should address those, those points. Um, so I hope that that helps. I mean, it's a very, brief overview. Um, I mean, there is there is quite a lot to discuss with biodiversity data because it is it can be quite rich. I mean, I know somebody somebody has wrote, uh, you know, PIDs on digital objects of biological data. Yes, there are. It, it's big data, effectively. Um, and this is, again, why making data machine readable is very important, too, because then you can use, start to use these computational methods, such as text and data mining, to really extract um, the, the data that you need from sort of a much larger um, instance. So those, those studies that I mentioned that Natalie Cooper and uh, Emily Buckingham uh, conducted at, at the Natural History Museum were similar to that. So there were these large studies of um, various natural history collections and pulling out that data using computational methods and, and recombining it in a way that would help find new patterns within the data. And I think that's where a lot of the, the innovation in a lot of the um, digital research will will take biodiversity research. So it's quite, I think it's quite an exciting time. And I'm really excited actually for, for you, Vita, and, and for your colleagues um, to sort of see what, what, you, what will happen when you have your database uh, up and running and integrated. So uh, I look forward to hearing more about, about those developments. Uh, yes, and what you describe sounds very laborious. 
Okay. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, it can be. <laughs> so, it usually be. Um, yeah. It I sounds think... easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yes, I'm looking forward to, to that, to, to discuss further about our own database uh, to make it online as well. Um, next question, I think. Um, hang on, it's moving by itself. What is the general rule or ethics of using raw data that has been published for a paper or now, deposit, now deposited in a public repository? For example, raw EDNA metabarcoding data of uh, uh, phytoplankton from a research cruise expedition mm. that deposited in SRI gene bank and such thing. Um, is it okay to use such data just by correctly citing the original authors or is it necessary to get the permission? This is where uh, data licenses will come in. So I mentioned um, Creative Commons licenses uh, for one thing. Um, often data repositories will list uh, the license. So it will describe whether the data can be used. So CC0, for instance, um, is openly available, or sorry, openly available without any restrictions. Um, CCBY 4.0, which you'll see actually appended to my presentation, uh, is means that 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 digital object can be reused, but it must be cited. So usually the CC license will come with a citation that you can then use. So thankfully in biodiversity, much of the data is already open. I mean, if there may be rare cases where they've had to restrict data because of um, the economic. Um, you know, or the or the, the endangerment of, of that particular taxa that's being described. So, for uh, you know, I mentioned the nesting locate geolocations of nesting birds or uh, rare plant species. So, for instance, I know in um, in Ohio, uh, ginseng, wild ginseng, is is endangered because people are harvesting it and selling it. Um, so, in order to protect the ginseng, a lot of the locations are are withheld. Um, Otherwise, the data is released openly. So we, we know that ginseng occur in, in Ohio, but we don't have the exact location. So that's kind of where that, that open, openness can, can, can change a bit. Um, luckily, there isn't really a lot of need to restrict um, biodiversity data otherwise. So it's not, not like medical data, for instance, or patents, which uh, would actually need to be uh, safeguarded under, under legal and ethical constraints and commercial constraints. Um, so again, I think um, most data it, it, that's available in a public database will have will be free to use. Uh, certainly, GBIF um, specifies this. A lot of the conditions for the data use should be specified in a public repository. So hopefully, that will that will help you. And uh, they'll also have some guidelines on how to cite that data as well. So, for instance, uh, the plankton survey data you can probably find a reference on how, how to, a, a license on how that data can be reused and cited uh, so that it will uh, gain credit uh, for the researcher. And they'll also be able to see how that, how you're going to be using that data for your own work. Okay, so you suggest that uh, whenever we want to store our data in a repository, just ensure the, uh, the condition for access. Uh, Exactly. Yes, yes. That's that's very important because that will that will ensure that it's very easy to use your data. So if somebody um, again, somebody consults the database and finds your data and, and they see that 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 license has been applied and then they know, OK, well, I can use it, but then I have to cite and, and here's the citation and that's fine. And that actually saves a lot of time. Um, it saves a lot of ambiguity. Um, I mean, it's, it's always a good thing to ask anyway, um, but I think as the data is open and if it's a data that can be cited, you can do so. If it's CC0, you, you can just, you're free to use it in any way you want. Um, you might see, if you look into the Natural History Museum's data portal, uh, you might see that some of the content is CC0 licensed. So that means you can use it in different ways. And actually they have quite a fun, you know, if you're looking for, sort of, you know, a fun exploration of the data. They have some uh, skulls of fossil sloths, which you can actually 3D print if you have a 3D printer. And those are CC0 as well. Um, so you can you can freely make use of that data for, for different purposes. And this is actually great because it enables this data to be used in many different fields, as well as uh, within the biological sciences. 
Okay, well noted that. Um, uh, hang on, it's moving again, so I have to scroll up. Um, how your experience being the, the data manager in your current and previous work in the university? How is the engagement with academic and researcher? It's, it's really interesting. I actually really enjoy my work, uh, partly because I, I get to engage with research in many different ways. Um, the, my full-time job at the moment is not necessarily always focused on biodiversity, although uh, there are, the biodiversity data can be part of, of that role. Um, Middlesex University, where I work, is quite a, an interesting university. Uh, it, it has many different disciplines represented, so everything from sciences, uh, engineering, business, through to uh, more um, practice-based types of research, so dance, film, visual arts. Um, and it's quite interesting to see the different ways you can support uh, this, this research, um, particularly as a lot of research is digital now. So I really enjoy engaging with the academics, finding out about their research, and then finding out how best um, to support uh, their research data needs. Um, so it's, it's always interesting. Um, and I, I really enjoy the job. Um, I, I, I also really especially enjoy the, the biological research still. I mean, that, that's, that was my background. Uh, and indeed, uh, that work with uh, data in different ways has actually informed my work in librarianship, just because of that, that I, the idea of structuring data and having taxonomies which can be used to organize information, so much like Linnaeus with his paper slips. <laughs> yeah, so I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully a bit easier now that it's now that it's online. <laughs> okay. Um so um is there any um uh, the, the, the issue that usually comes the most uh, uh issue that comes in engagement with the academic and researcher, you know, like uh, structures or accessibility or validity or anything? Mm -hmm. Strangely, well, interestingly, the most uh, common issue that comes up is sort of a reluctance to share data. And I can understand that. I mean, data mm. underpins a lot of research. Researchers are often, depending on the, the discipline area, I mean, biodiversity, thankfully, it's, it's not so much because there is such an impetus to share the data because it has such a broad effect. I mean, if you share data, it could contribute to policy that will, will help protect the environment or it could be used say, for instance, to complete a phylogeny of a, of, a, of a taxa. So these are all really useful and collaborative ways of working. Um, but I know in some disciplines um, that data can be very, protect very protective of data. You know, they want to use it to publish. They think if they, if they, if they share the data openly, it might get taken um, and used by another researcher. But actually, um, it's more likely, and particularly with the data licenses, because you're legally obliged to cite that data, you actually gain more impact by making your data open mm -hmm. if, if, you yes. can, if you can do so. so. Certainly, um, I really encourage um, open data wherever possible because you'll gain much greater reach for your research. The other interesting thing is you don't really know how your data could be used, yeah. um, which I think is, is really important. So say for instance you have some you know i've, I've seen this there, there was some geological data looking at seismic frequencies and actually that data which was generated in a, in a geology department was taken and used uh, to produce music so they, they made oh. music looking at the, you know the frequency data they, they took that and sort of put it into some software that made it into sort of sound and so they had this sort of music that was generated from this geological data. So I think that's really where the power of open data comes in because not only do you, can you gain reach within your, within your discipline, but also externally to your discipline as well. Yes, and certainly yes, again, for important. biodiversity data, this is important because you're reaching not only other scientists within biology and in the biological sciences, but you could be affecting policy, you could be affecting agriculture, pharmacy, you know, many different things. And because the natural systems are so fundamental to, to our survival and to life on earth, I think this is a very important reach. So I think, again, uh, making that data openly available is very important. Well noted. It's, it's still, it's happened everywhere on <laughs> the yeah. sharing and locking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next, 
Next question. If we have a collaboration with other governments, should we release all the data that we have or can we keep some for ourselves and only release the data if other party requests? Should we make some document for those requests? Again, another question on access and sharing. Definitely. No, I think I think it's important to have, particularly if you're sharing data at such a high level, it's important to have a data sharing agreement. Uh, this was something I didn't really touch on in my, my talk, but uh, it's important to know. I mean, again, for biodiversity data, I think it, it, it is important to make that data open and to share. So, for instance, much data that's generated by the Natural History Museum is, is openly available, and that gets aggregated by GBIF, which, again, is accessible to anyone. So government governmental organizations can use that, governmental departments all over the world. Um, and again, it's this idea of democratizing the data as well. Um, and ensuring that there's access to those who, who may need it, um, you know, for, for various purposes. It could be, could be citizen scientists looking at a local biota, for instance, and doing a survey within their own local area, but also I think much more broadly as well, looking at, you know, say for instance, the IPBES, looking at um, the effects of the anthropogenic climate change on, on worldwide biodiversity too. So I think having that ability to share, I think at different levels is very important. So definitely uh, think about having a data sharing agreement. Um, this may require some work with, with a legal department in order to draft it, but uh, certainly that will um, provide the necessary conditions. So say for instance, you have data that you think should be protected. So like um, the geolocations of um, rare species that you don't want to release into the public domain, that data can be, can be safeguarded. Um, so yeah, that having the, the agreement will actually outline those conditions where data is shared and where data can be held back. Um, I think even for academic publishing too, it's you can hold back some data. Um, the other thing is you don't you don't have to share everything, but I think it actually is helpful if you do because then that increases the reach of your, of your research. Yes, yes, I, I agree. That. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope you're not. Uh exhausted yet because we still have a lot of questions and it's keep <laughs> scrolling up <laughs> um next question i understand that it, it is an important to make biodiversity data able to use or reuse for later in or in the future what kinds of complexity that you mostly find when organizing biodiversity data that, that's a very good question. I mean, biodiversity data, as I mentioned before, is extremely complex and very heterogeneous and often involves um, multiple components. You often have, you know, I mentioned with the, the extended specimen concept, which is sort of a very new concept that's come out. Um, I'd recommend having a look at the, um, the link that I sent for the Alliance, because that actually describes much more uh, in depth about the extended specimen and how that might potentially work, because you're, you're linking data across different um, institutional collections across different countries. I think it's that linking and integration of data, which which is very which can be very complex. Um, and again, that thankfully there are um, you know there's been the development of, of standards such as Darwin Core yeah. and XML and it I and even digital object identifiers, which in theory sound very easy, but actually can be quite. Um, <laughs> Tell can me be about quite, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> can be quite. Um, sometimes can be quite complicated to um, apply. So it's just trying to think about how, how best to link those different um, data types together in a way that would make sense. And also how to describe that data using metadata or document, you know, additional documentation such as readme documentation, which I think is very useful. Um, just a, just a, an example from my own case, which probably simplifies things a bit too much. But so when I was working, um, and studying uh, freshwater red algae, um, I had generated some uh, DNA sequence data and also some herbarium specimens. So in order to ensure that that data could be reused, I created a small document saying, here, or, here are some vials you know, with DNA you know, that are in the freezer, you know, somewhere in the back of the freezer somewhere. Um, you know, these are the specimen numbers that I've given them. They didn't have DOIs then because it was just the specimen numbers and here's, other information that relates to it. And I made a small document. It took me maybe five minutes to put together. Um, 10 years later, even though I'm, I'm no longer in biology, my, my former master's supervisor was able to take that readme document and use it to um, publish another paper using those DNA samples. Uh -huh. And again, there you go. That's, a, that's an immediate 
example where you see that that data reuse will create impact because my I was included as an author on that paper. And um, even though I'm no longer in the field, I still had some research published based on some previous work that I had done before. So I think that that shows the power of, of just spending some time to make sure that you have very rich descriptive metadata that describes what the data is and how it could potentially be reused uh, within, within your area. Um, I, again, it sounds very simple. It, it can be quite complicated, again, given how data links together uh, in biodiversity, but it's, it's worth exploring. And I think uh, certainly um, any kind of metadata that you provide will ensure the sort of the, the future usability and reusability of your data. Usability and reuse. Hang on, feasibility and usability. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, not that. So even labeling and then put all the label with all the information in something is important. It is. It is. So this was just a small, you know, a little text document written in, you know, the Microsoft notebook, like just a little. Yeah, thing. <laughs> anyway, I do that. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just saved that alongside um, some of the sequence, you know, the, the sequence data that I had produced, you know, with a link to sort of say this, this sequence has come from this specimen. Yeah. Um, and, yes, you know, that's very important. Very important. Yeah. And it, again, that that really helped uh, increase the usability because then you know what it is. Otherwise, it's just sort of here are some small vials containing some <clears throat> DNA. Yeah, <laughs> just throw it away. Something, yeah, and they're just sort of there. So what, what do they relate to? Where are the sequences from that DNA sample? So interlinking those, I think, was was quite useful. Yes, we'll note that. We'll remember that. Uh, next question that's going up. In terms of publishing our bio biodiversity data, sometimes some publication and data repository are limited to access. What do you think about that? How should we deal with this issue? See, again, that issue. Yes, yeah, that, that is, publishing can be quite complicated as well because publishers often impose their own restrictions on um, how information and data can be published. So often um, it's behind paywalls. Increasingly, uh, certainly in the UK, national funders are, are advocating, basically saying that publicly funded data are a public good. So that data should be made open wherever possible. And it's here that institutional repositories can, can play a very strong role um, because I think, um, I mean, it would have to, unfortunately it would have to align in some cases with what the expect expectations of the publishers are. But for the most part, I think you can um, publish data in institutional repositories, uh, which again, makes the data citable um, you can also version the data as well. So say you only publish a section of the data, you could then have, the, have a full version archived in an institutional repository elsewhere, but certainly um, look at more open ways of publishing data wherever possible. Interestingly, there's a lot of, there are um, data journals for biodiversity, blah, sorry, for biodiversity data as well. And I think it's yeah. worth exploring how to publish data there too, because those, those journals are, open access, um, and they're often specifically for um, publishing biodiversity data to ensure that the institution and the researcher gain credit for that, for that work in um, annotating that data and making it uh, something that can potentially be a resource for reuse. Mm -hmm. I'll see if I can send a link around with um, some examples yes, of yes. data journals, because I think that might be, might be helpful. That's very helpful. Is that, is that the bio with something? Bio RX? I, I would... Oh yes, bio archive. Yes, yes. So that's a oh. that's a that's a very good example actually already. That's a preprint uh, server. So it's not specifically a data journal as such, but it can be used um, to publish versions that are sort of pre-publication. So um, you know, of, often to publish an academic article, it can take quite some time. Yeah. Um, so in order to get around that, using preprint servers can help make that content available um, more quickly. However, it would have to be a different version from the final published version. Often the publishers will try to retain copyright of, of that work that's published within their journal. So it would, it would involve looking at the conditions of the publisher that you're publishing with and then seeing whether you can, you can then publish a preprint. 
but yeah, I would recommend I would recommend preprint servers or um, data journals. Thank you. That oh, now I understand. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, uh, next questions from the example on articles for machine readable data. Are they one of the usability practice of data set in bio research? I'm not quite sure. I understand the question is. Um, article for machine readable data are they reusable uh, are the reusability practice of data set in bio research actually i'm not sure that, could you get something on this i think I, I i'm not sure i don't i'm not sure i understand the question either but i what it, would you so is this looking at whether those studies can be reused or not looking at weight so um, those those studies are actually taken from the Natural History Museum's data portal itself, um, and I believe they might include a link to GitHub, which shows some of the scripts that I, I'd have to check because I can't. I, it's been quite a while since I've looked at them, um, but I think there may be a script um, available as well. So this is another interesting aspect of, of data management: is sometimes software, um, particularly if it's a piece of software that's been written for a research purpose can also be treated like data in some ways and oh. made fair and reusable as well. So um, GitHub, which is a, a, a large online repository for um, software and code, um, can also be used uh, to do this as well very easily. So um, it's not necessarily a long-term archive for the software because you can you can version it but it's yes. useful because it provides a doi uh through zenodo which is the the repository i used to deposit a version of this of this presentation um so yeah software okay. software can also be complicated <laughs> but um <laughs> but um definitely think if you're writing code or scripts that are doing you know machine readable you know text and data mining for instance Think about archiving them in, in GitHub um, and then potentially linking them to an institutional repository because that will ensure that those those bits of code can be reused. Okay. So in the meantime, it's probably about the code and that software sometimes is also a research itself and could be reusable in the future. Although, yeah, it's um, very easily to change uh, mm -hmm. and updated. No, certainly, certainly. And I mean, that again, the whole uh, system of citation, scholar, citation of scholarly works, that, that's a really good thing to consider when you're, when you're reusing research, you know, oh, ensure yes. that you're looking at um, the licenses as well to ensure that you're, you know, particularly because some publishers impose paywalls, unfortunately, um, it's important to acknowledge to make sure that you're not breaching copyright um, and also that the researchers are getting credit for the, the work that they've produced. Um, and you know that that can also lead to collaborations as well because sometimes you know if you if you're citing a particular researcher quite a lot it could be the case that you could develop a collaboration. Um, that's one of the great things about uh, scientific research I think is there there is possibility for networking and and collaboration in a, in a more social area as well. Um, okay. Um... Okay. This is a question from Guardiono. According to your opinion or experience, will biodiversity data of all type can be digitized or will, will it be enough to rely on metadata, metadata in the near future? That's a really good question, actually. Um, I, I, I know, um, you know, going back to Rennie's comment that PIDs on, PIDs on digital objects of, of biodiversity data, there's billions of it. So yes. data, data is increasing. And I think digital research um, is starting to become much more data centric. I mean, this is certainly what my PhD research is focusing on, looking at how uh, taxonomy and systematics research practices have gone from being primarily focused on specimens and working sort of in a very physical realm to moving into a much more digital and data focused realm and using computational methods to kind of interrogate these large volumes of data. So again, here, I think research data management can play a really important role um, mm. in ensuring that that data is, is usable um, and accessible sort of for the long term. So it's, it's um, interesting to see how that will go. I mean, metadata can be usable 
um, to a certain degree, but I think it's not as usable as if you have, say, a file, for instance. So if you have a DOI that resolves to the actual digital object, you know, it, it, via the metadata, I think that's probably the most useful thing because then you not only have the metadata that describes what this item is, but then you also have potentially the digital item itself to work with. That being said, not all um, not all data is necessarily digital. I mean, certainly, um, you know, as I from the historical underpinnings of of taxonomy and systematics, a lot of that relies on physical specimens. So herbarium, you know, herbarium specimens. Um, you know, physical specimens in museums, pinned insects, um, even literature. So in some cases, artworks or historic antiquarian manuscripts, um, you know, some of the earliest descriptions of life on earth are, you know, they, they can be digitized, most certainly. Um, but I think also having the physical item, uh, retaining the physical item is very important. And this is again, where museums and libraries can play a very strong role in uh, being effectively an archive for the sciences for biodiversity and, and providing that, that database of physical objects uh, for, for, for use and research. Okay. Um, that's a, this is a similar question, I guess. Um, uh, not really similar. What if our biodiversity data like specimen or catalogs damage and or lost due to force major? What should we do with their digital repository? Mm, again, that's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, it, it can happen that specimens become damaged or physical specimens become damaged or lost. I think here the digital surrogate then becomes very important because it, it's effectively now acting as the primary specimen for that, that one that's lost or missing. So in a way, it's good that you have that uh, in order to have a record of that. I mean, some, I think in the past, many specimens were destroyed or lost. Um, some type specimens, I think, are, are only representative, say, for instance, by artworks or text. Yeah. Um, again, is, a, is, a, is um, a pity because you no longer have that specimen to refer to and you have to rely on an observer account, which may not give you all of the features that you need um, to adequately describe it. So having a digital surrogate like that, I think is important. Again, I don't think that the, you know, I think it's important to retain as much data as you can about a tax, uh, about a taxa. So um, you have the physical specimen ideally and the digital specimen and they would, they would complement each other. Um, so having a look at, for instance, at that extended uh, specimen concept, I think is, is useful, but uh, yeah, in some cases, it may not always be possible and the data is incomplete. So it's just trying to make the best use of what, what you might have uh, available. Okay, so make best use, but keep the record. Okay. And keep, the, keep the record, definitely. Uh, yeah, because that, that I think is, it's important to show that you've had that, that specimen there, you know, particularly if it's a type specimen as well, because that's, those are, are crucial for uh, taxonomic um, yes. Mm. Yes, I have a lot of um, complaint about missing type specimen. <laughs> oh. Uh. Um. <laughs> okay, that's for later. I have the interesting question here about um, from your experience: Is there any case of data data abuse by the data manager? Is there any potential of such misdemeanor? Hmm. Interestingly, well, uh, thankfully, I haven't come across very many, which which is good because, again, I think that yeah. the open nature of biodiversity data and the fact that it can be easily shared um, in different contexts and, and that it provides such an important uh, use by being shared, that means that the data can't, you know, that's not to say that, that abuse doesn't happen. So, for instance, I mentioned that the uh, this idea of sort of putting into the public domain information about rare species and where you can find them. And of course, someone would come in and, you know, exploit those, those species for sort of economic gain. Um, but I think that ha that's a very rare exception. So I, I don't really see many, many um, instances of, of, of that happening. Um, I guess the other issue, again, is sort of data ownership. And I think um, particularly with the, I mentioned before, the importance of indigenous data and yeah. uh, local local communities. And I know there's a feeling sometimes that um, that data can be taken in, in a way that isn't ethical. 
um, and maybe used in a way that isn't ethical. So again, that's I'm really glad to see that they have these the so there's fair, but then there's also care for indigenous yeah, data yeah. specifically, uh, which I think is really important. And I mean, these this data unfortunately has been excluded quite a bit from uh, Western sort of scientific discourse. So I think bringing that indigenous perspective and that worldview in uh, is will be very important um, for for biodiver- various types of biodiversity research. So it's an area that I'm I'm still learning about, and I, I really want to explore uh, much further. Thank you for that. Um, now on the uh, probably for dummies like me. Do you know the standardized metadata that can be used in representing big biodiversity data? I, I suppose that is the Tadwig or uh, the Darwin Core. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that would that would most likely be Darwin Core. I mean, there are other there are other sort of like there's an it, there's the ABC uh, ABCD yeah. schema that's used as well. So there there are different schemas, and actually, DataCite have a schema that relates to DOIs. So, it, it, but there, I find that that metadata schema can be very skeletal and doesn't, it's, it's not discipline specific. So it's not related to um, biodiversity data specifically. It's more sort of a, a data structure, a metadata structure that will enable that DOI to capture the key elements that are needed uh, for that digital object. Um, okay. But certainly, certainly the, um, the Darwin core uh, is an XML as well, XML, um, you know that will make that sort of a very commonly used uh, metadata standard and it, it's used not only in biodiversity data but much more broadly which enables um, the data to be harvested you know used in computational ways so by, by machines uh, and I think again that will be helpful particularly for big data so big volumes of data aggregating large data collections together for instance um, say you want to go into GBIF and sort of extract all of the data related to a particular uh, taxon across different collections, for instance, that that would be, um, you know, that, that's where that metadata would, would be very helpful. Okay. So what happened to the ABC and everything else? I, I heard that for, for the first time in 2009, I guess, from Fat and um, And uh, I heard that in the Tajwik forum, People are, you know, like competing which structure that can be most used. So what yeah. happened now other than Darwin Core? Yeah, I, I, I'm unfortunately, I, I mainly, I've been following mostly the Darwin Core uh, work. Um, there was also for a while life science IDs, which were, you know, the barcode of life. Um, but those seem to have fallen out of favor. Um, they are still mm. used in some, you know, they are still being used. So it's, again... The, the issue with standards is you should really have a standard that that will best encapsulate the work, but often there are com- sometimes competing standards, um, which can make things difficult. But I think having one standard that works in, in multiple yeah. cases, I think, is, is the best the way easiest. to go. Yes. The easiest, definitely. Okay. And, it, and certainly, um, you know, it, it reduces a lot of the difficulties between mapping data between different databases, for instance. Um, so again, I would really recommend if, if you're working in the area, if you're managing data in biodiversity, get involved in some of the research data alliance uh, working groups, like the um, because I, I think there you can really have an input into how these standards are created uh, and used. So I, I'd recommend having a look at, at those the links to get involved and see where you can you can fit in if if you want if you would like to like to do that. Good. Uh, yes, uh, well noted that. Um, I hope you're still energized. Oh, yeah, still, <laughs> still energized. I had my coffee. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm Next again. question. You, you mentioned about GBIF. GBIF. Are the data at the museum are shared or linked to GBIF? Yes, they are. So um, the GBIF, GBIF is sort of a, an aggregator of data. So it, it will actually take in data from different institutions. Mm-hmm. And the NHM is one of the institutions that provide regularly provides uh, GBIF with, with, uh, with data. So it will sort of effectively upload uh, data from the NHM uh, data portal into uh, GBIF. Um, so in that sense, GBIF is, is a really useful source if you're if you're starting your project and you want to look to see what data is already available. 
Again, I, I will emphasize that GBIF tends to focus on occurrence data. So the most uh, common data type within GBIF will be occurrence data um, rather than say necessarily tax, taxonomic data as such. But um, I think it's still useful to look there and, and then you'll have a, have a good idea of what data is available for, for your projects. Oh, hang on. The, um, the issue with aggregator is, um, you know, the quality control. I, yes. uh, it is often that people complain about taking data from GGB and it's a terrestrial pl uh, plant, but then the position is in the open sea. So uh, how is actually it works so for the quality control of data that mm. been published in, that, that's in a, aggregator? That's Mm. No, that's a very good question and, and probably one that's difficult to answer because, again, the, the quality of the data will depend very much on how it's processed at the institution that generates the data. And that's, again, why research data management is very important because that will not only ensure that the data can be reused, but also that it will be of a sufficient quality for reuse. So, for instance, ensuring that the metadata adequately describes that, that data and also that even that the data that is shared is, has been cleaned and is, a, is effectively appropriate for reuse. So I know that that has been an issue with GBIF, um, you know, that, that data isn't always of, of sufficient quality. So I think that's that, that can be a bit of a difficulty. And again, particularly with big data approaches where you're using computational methods, you might not always pick up on those um, data sets that may not be of sufficient quality. But again, I think um, having within your own practice, uh, having um, good metadata practices, ensuring the use of persistent identifiers that can actually help um, identify you know, where, where the data is coming from. So maybe if you find that there's data of insufficient quality that that data could be somehow eliminated from, from any, any research. You know, if you're working with that data and you don't want it, you could eliminate it or perhaps contact um, the institution or the individual that generated that data and see if it can be um, ameliorated. Uh, if, it, if it has them. Okay, so, check back to, so check back to the contributor, is it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, check, check back to the contributor. Let them know as well. I mean, if, if it's possible, it may not always be the case that it's possible yeah. to find, you know, particularly for, for older data, but... Um, Certainly, uh, having good metadata practices yourself will will ensure that the data that you're publishing you'll you'll have a a much higher standard uh, for that data. Okay, so three more questions, <laughs> uh, but it's probably already uh, uh, explained more beforehand. So. Do you have any practical example of embargo in opening biodiversity data? And what do you think about embargo itself? Mm. That, again, that's a very interesting question. So ideally, um, biodiversity data should be made openly available as soon as possible. Well, according to public funding policy in the UK, open data should be made as openly available as possible within the shortest possible time. But often there's recognition that there's need uh, for the researcher to, to use that data for their own academic work. So to publish that data, to get some academic credit for that data. So there can be, you know, a, a leeway, you know, you can actually embargo the data. Sometimes publishers will actually do this anyway. They'll embargo data, um, yeah. although it, it should, yeah. So it, it should comply, ideally it should comply with funder and publisher policy and there, there should be a way to kind of balance um, both, you know, if, if you're with a publisher who will embargo the data. Um, but that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, again, in biodiversity, I, I don't see a lot of um, need to necessarily embargo the data as such, because you can, you know, it, it can be released, it can be used in different, different ways. And often it's um, a, a credit both to the researcher and to the institution. So by releasing the data, you're actually gaining more impact by, by doing so. Um, but I, there is that there is that balance between um, making your own publications as an academic researcher versus um, releasing the data openly um, right away. Um, so that that that's something I think that that uh, the researcher themselves need to work out. But yeah, best best to release it openly and and get broader impact. Yeah. Okay. That's need to be considered. Okay. Um, 
There's another question. Do you think it is necessary for research that a manager to provide training for biodiversity researcher in the institution, especially in RDM, in order to able conduct proper monitoring and maintaining quality of the data? Yes, yes. No, I, I very much agree with, <laughs> with I think training, training is necessary um, in RDM for many different disciplines. I think, um, again, research data management can have such an impact on um, how, how the quality of your data, how, it, how uh, much impact you can gain from your work, and actually the reach of your, re of your research as well. So RDM, I think, is a very crucial aspect of research, particularly in the digital realm, now that data is um, or now that research is much more digital, much more online, um, having that ability to manage your data and, and to know best practices will actually help you thrive in this, in this digital research environment. Mm. But if I will be in such training, probably my biggest question is, um, so what to do with this data research, what to store and what to release? at what stage and how about the quality and uh, but probably more to that. Do you have a comment on that? Oh yes, yeah, certainly. So that, that relates back to what I, what I mentioned earlier in, in the discussion part of the webinar on um, data management planning. So uh -huh. plan. certainly, yeah, definitely plan. So this will help you determine, you know, what, what will your data look like ultimately? What are you, you know, with your research, research can change as well and evolve yeah. certainly as you go through, through the process. So the plan doesn't have to be a, a static document and certainly data are not static either. They, they change yeah. quite a bit, which is why data management I think is so important. Um, so having an idea of what data you're producing, how it's going to be used, you know, what, what is your end result? What are you trying to achieve through your publication? And again, that can, that can change again throughout the course of the project. So keeping that plan updated, I think, is important. It can also determine what you'll end up keeping and sharing. So maybe you won't need to share all of your data. Certainly, you'll want to share a cleaned up version of your data, but all of the raw data you might not want to share, partly because there might be yeah. too much of it. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and probably not useful. <laughs> probably not useful, exactly. So, um, you know, you have, you know, say, you know, taking the example of a genomic sequence, maybe you'll have a lot of sort of junk regions where you don't, you don't want that. You can cut those out and, you know, you could archive the, you could archive, definitely archive the raw data. So you have a record, but you won't necessarily want to share, you know, a whole sequence. You might just want to share a, re a gene region or something. So yeah. again, it's thinking about what, what parts of that data you want to actually uh, publish share. and yeah. share. Okay, well noted. This is very enlightening. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, oh. <laughs> one, one more, but I think this is just need a comment from you. So uh, this is from Bu Peggy. I got B5 GB funds and have uploaded the butterfly specimen data, data to GB. Please confirm if the metadata that we put there is sufficient and good for the principle of fair. I might contact you again via email. Yes, please do. Please do. I, you know, I'm I'm very happy to help answer any 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 further questions you have, um, because I know this was a very short time really to have a talk about quite a, a big topic. Um, so I know there was quite a lot of things that I may not have covered uh, in sufficient detail. So no, you're more than welcome to contact me. I'd recommend email um, yeah. rather than necessarily social media because <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I'm not very good at, at checking <laughs> at checking yes. those. Um, uh, I don't no, do it please, either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> please, <laughs> please email me. Um, I, you know, I will, I will eventually. You know, sometimes it takes a few days to get back to you, but I will, I will get back to you. And also, I'll be sure to send around some some extra resources, um, which might be useful just from a more basic research data management perspective as well. Just so you'll have, you know, for instance, knowing how to how to write a data management plan. Um, looking at some ideas for data sharing and, and that mentor course that I um, recommended as well for, for those who are managing data or who are librarians who want to learn more about research data management too. Um, so there's there's several different resources I'll send, I'll send around in addition to my presentation. Um, but yes, you're welcome. You're welcome to contact me and, you know, it would be great to keep in touch as well to find out, uh, you know, what, 
how your um, how your own infrastructure is, is developing. You know, I'd really love to hear more about your national research repository um, and sort mm. of how, how you how you are managing data um, at, at Leapy. So uh, yeah, please please keep in touch and, and let me know. <laughs> Uh, you should contact by Andrew then. <laughs> oh, I, yes. Oh, yeah. I have uh, my own question. Last question, please. So um, about the citizen science, um, mm. probably you have a sort of a experience on the best practice of it, uh, how uh, um, the coordinator, the one who, who gather the, uh, the data, how do you curate the data uh, to, to put the quality and how to use it? Uh, is, there a, uh, is there any step in that that government um, interfere? You mean probably DEFRA have some guideline on how gathering data from the public and on, on the biodiversity and else? Certainly, I'll see. I'll, I mean, I, I, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. I mean, again, because citizen sciences can be very diverse, um, you know, many people, are, you know, everything from Zooniverse, for instance, where people are, are sort of annotating data that's already been collected to people who are doing bio blitzes and, and maybe going out into the field and collecting data on floristics or, um, yeah. or faunistics. Um, so again, data quality is it's an interesting interesting issue to, to look into. I'll see if I can find, um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a, have a quick answer for you, um, <laughs> but I'll see if I can find, <laughs> I'll see if I can find some, some guidelines for you. But I think as, as the data curator, um, annotate, again, just going back to those basic principles of having good metadata, you know, who, who collected the data, where, when, um, you know, any related conditions within the metadata, I think, and having an annotation like that will be very helpful because that will ensure that you can you you can sort of judge the, the quality of the data and also how it might potentially be reused as well because you know citizen science data it's very important for scientific research even though it's been collected by sort of so-called amateur naturalists um, but people who are very enthusiastic yeah. about, about nature and I think it's important uh, again to have that that input. Um, you know, because that, that, that data can often inform in many interesting ways. So I'll see if I can find some, yeah. some additional, additional work for you. Thank you so much, Sarah. You are you're probably very exhausted right now because there's so much. You have talked for more than one and a half hour, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like it. No, it's been, it's been wonderful to, to be here. I'm very interested in, I mean, this is, this is a topic that interests me me quite a lot so I feel like I didn't talk enough in some ways but I think there's there's so much in biodiversity data there's so much in research data management itself as well and I'm very conscious that I don't think I covered in great detail a lot of the different aspects so yes you're well, more than welcome to uh, keep in touch with me um, email me if you have any further questions um, and I'd, I'd really like to just keep in touch and and continue the discussion uh, beyond the webinar as well so, yes yeah, yes would, look forward yeah. for that yes i think we yes, need yeah. to to learn a lot from each other yeah, um, well, and, oh, oh sorry yeah i know i'm learning, uh, learning a lot from you as well so it's been it's been a pleasure to to be here this afternoon um thank you again for uh to you and, and renny and also uh, hendro thank you very much for inviting me to come and and speak to you today um and yes i look forward to our further discussion uh, but before I end uh, the discussion, I probably ask, have to ask Hendro if you have probably some question for Sarah. No, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. too, too long you to talk to you, so I think you accepted. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been wonderful. Thank you, Hendro, for it's it's been wonderful to to be here today. Um, I'm really it's been wonderful to meet all of you as well. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. It would be, I think it would be wonderful to, to sort of visit. So I hope, I hope we'll, I'll have that chance in the future. Um, but it's been, in the meantime, it's been wonderful to meet you here online uh, as well. So thank you again for, for hosting for this, for this webinar. Thank you again, Sarah. It's, it's, it's very, it's, it's a very long thing. Yes, I, I have to say that uh, what you share is very, um, uh, make us more understand on biodiversity data and how it's the importance of open science and how it's actually 
uh, work the open science because I think a lot of people here not really um, familiar with the open science. It th it still thinks that raw, raw data is the one that being published. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Um, but but yeah no I'm I'm yeah very very happy to help and I'd be very interested actually to follow the, the other um, speakers in your webinar too because it looks like you have a very comprehensive uh, interesting um, selection of events coming up so you know thank you again I'm really really honored to be part of of this webinar series uh, and I and yes I'm happy also uh, to continue the discussions around open open data and biodiversity data as well so. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, you too. Thank you again, Sarah, for sharing with us. And um, also to all the audience that's already uh, throw some questions, very interesting and very enlightening. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, be, but I think before we end, we have uh, another poll already. Is that correct? Yes, uh, so uh, member audience, please, uh, uh, I, we do appreciate your, uh, 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 your contribution here on uh, Paul. Now it's popping up on your screen. So uh, please do uh, fill that in again and we'll uh, share the results to you. It's about today's event. Will anything that Sarah present change your mind or not? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. If okay. not, I'm happy to come back and do another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we end the poll already? Okay, is it done? Okay. So oh, yes. Okay, wonderful. Oh. Yes, great. your presentation yes, is work. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's that's really great, great to see as well. So yeah, yeah, I'm glad that um, that you've understood a little bit more about research data management and making data fair as well, uh, yes. which I think is very, very important for you know not only for open research but just as a best practice um, to increase the impact of your work as well. Um, so that's wonderful. Yeah, it's great to see as well that the, uh, that there's consideration of providing research data services in the institution. That's that's really good. So I'll be sure to send around those other links to resources which might be of interest uh, and certainly of use for for your own reference as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we're looking for that uh, forward to that. Hang on. Um, so with that, uh, I shall end this discussion. Um, thank you again to Sarah and thank you for all the audience again for joining us. Um, I think I can return this floor to Reni. Uh, back to you, Reni. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yep, thank you. Thank you, everyone in the audience, and thank you again. Yeah, um, well. Wow, that's a productive and inspiring discussion today. Many food for thought. And for your information, I spent like a whole day exploring the whole building of NHM and that's very wonderful experience. Thank you, Ms. Vita, for helping us moderating this session. It's very much appreciated. And thank you, Sarah, for your knowledge sharing. And thank you to the audience for your wonderful participation. You can access the recording of the webinar on our YouTube at Kepustakaan PDD Lipi. Then the presented material can be accessed on the link put on the chat, bit.ly or DM series five uh, material or the other link that uh, put on the chat there. And for your information, we are going to have the fourth uh, international conference on documentation information in October, 2021. You can check the link on the chat if you have a specific interest in data and information uh, discipline. Then thank you. I finally and officially closed the fifth webinar series. Good afternoon, stay safe and healthy. See you on our next RDM webinar series. Bye. All right, thank you, Rani. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you Ita. Thank you. Saat ini, kegiatan penelitian di berbagai bidang memiliki tingkat ketergantungan yang tinggi terhadap data-data penelitian. Kemajuan yang sangat tinggi dalam kegiatan eksperimen yang didukung oleh teknologi komputasi telah mendorong kegiatan menggunakan dan menghasilkan data dalam volume, variasi, 
dan kecepatan yang sangat tinggi. Dalam era Open Science, data penelitian yang dihasilkan memungkinkan untuk diakses oleh peneliti lainnya, sehingga mereka dapat meningkatkan integritas dan kredibilitasnya. Kondisi penyimpanan data penelitian di Indonesia saat ini masih dilakukan secara terpisah di masing-masing institusi dan dilakukan oleh peneliti secara individual, sehingga cukup sulit bagi pemangku kepentingan di bidang riset untuk melihat sejauh mana perkembangan kegiatan riset berdasarkan data penelitian yang dimiliki dalam skala nasional. Terlebih lagi, repository institusi sebagai wadah penyimpanan aset pengetahuan saat ini baru dimanfaatkan sebatas menyimpan karya atau publikasi ilmiah. Di negara maju yang telah berkembang kegiatan risetnya, negara memiliki tanggung jawab dalam melakukan pengelolaan data penelitian melalui repository nasional seperti Australia dengan ENS, Inggris dengan UK Data Service, serta Belanda dengan DANS. Pengelolaan data penelitian dengan menyimpan pada media tertentu seperti komputer, laptop, atau eksternal hard disk kurang dapat diandalkan dan beresiko untuk rusak. Selain itu, ada resiko lain yang tak kalah berbahaya, yakni hilangnya media karena pencurian. Di mana hal ini sangatlah disayangkan, mengingat data tersebut adalah hasil kerja keras selama bertahun-tahun. Oleh karena itu, penyimpanan pada repository institusi menjadi solusi yang paling ideal. Perilaku peneliti dalam melakukan penyimpanan data penelitian sangat bervariasi. Dalam kajian yang dilakukan oleh tim PDII LIPI, bahwa selama ini peneliti melakukan penyimpanan paling banyak pada media laptop atau personal komputer dan berbagai penyimpanan eksternal. Kondisi ini diperparah dengan backup data yang dilakukan semaunya. Dalam melakukan penelitian, seorang peneliti idealnya sudah memiliki satu perencanaan manajemen data. Banyak sekali manfaat yang akan diperoleh peneliti, institusi, maupun negara ketika bisa menerapkan manajemen data penelitian dengan ideal, yakni Efisiensi Ketersediaan data pada repository nasional akan mengurangi kegiatan penelitian yang serupa. Safety Berbagai resiko kehilangan data yang disebabkan oleh perangkat penyimpanan dapat diminimalisir dan juga merupakan upaya untuk melindungi hak kekayaan intelektual. Quality Repository akan membantu peneliti untuk menjaga kualitas data dan proses kurasi memungkinkan data penelitian terpelihara sehingga dapat digunakan kembali. Reputation Seorang peneliti akan meningkat reputasinya saat datanya digunakan kembali oleh peneliti lainnya. Compliance Kewajiban menyimpan data yang ditetapkan penyandang dana penelitian dapat diakomodir melalui repository institusi. Pentingnya mendepositkan dan membagikan data jika dilakukan oleh peneliti terbagi menjadi tiga keuntungan. Bagi peneliti, dapat meningkatkan reputasi dan visibilitas penelitian individu. Bagi komunitas ilmiah, dapat meningkatkan kolaborasi. Dan bagi masyarakat, mereka akan mendapatkan akses yang lebih mudah ke dunia penelitian. LIPI, melalui Pusat Data dan Dokumentasi Ilmiah atau PDDI, menginisiasi kegiatan pengelolaan data penelitian melalui sistem penyimpanan data penelitian dengan nama Repository Ilmiah Nasional. Atau disingkat RIN Dengan kapasitas yang tak terbatas RIN mampu menyimpan dan berbagi data penelitian seluruh peneliti RIN mampu berkontribusi dalam pemetaan perkembangan dunia penelitian RIN, kunci kemajuan IPTEC Indonesia